Good morning and welcome back to C's Listening Room. Today I've got a very battered copy of Stuff by Holly McNarland. There's the cover there, the cute little Jack Russell Terrier. I'm sure a lot of people bought it just because of the cute dog on the front. It's actually her dog. Uh, basically, singer-songwriter guitarist from Canada, uh, who's also got an additional guitarist that probably plays all the juicy stuff. But before I get into that, I'm going to have to go on this long-winded deviation for a minute, for a couple minutes on how I first found out about this album. Uh, so I believe in 2001, I was driving home on this nice sunny day, windows down, you know, air conditioning on, and I was playing with the scan button on my car radio. I came across a station that I had never seen pop up before and I decided to listen to it like, where's this station coming from and they played this song starts out acoustic really starts to to get rocking and then the girl was singing I feel better when I'm numb and by the end of the song I was loving it. I'm like man I like this song I've got to find out what this song is and then I found out the radio station was broadcasting from Sarnia, Ontario, which is about an hour northeast of where I was listening to it at. And that was a little unusual because usually I don't get radio stations to the, that are that far to the north. Usually I can pick up stations that are that far to the east. Um, like I used to listen to The Rock out of Chatham, Ken, Ontario. That was a little ways east. But they're no longer on the air. They they became another station, and then that, and then another transmitter interfered with that frequency and blocked them out altogether. When it after they uh, had become, uh, I think a uh, like a Jack FM variety station. So rest in peace to the Rock. Out, uh, but I also used to be able to to get a station that was near the state line i think uh it was i think tower 98 i used to pick that up once in a while and i uh which was either monroe county michigan or lucas county ohio and i also used to sometimes get a rock station from toledo ohio but i never really picked up stations to the north that far north so that was unusual in and of itself. So I, I saved that in my presets. And I was hoping I would hear that song again. And I was hoping I'd hear that station again. And I went to a music store trying to look for a song that called I Feel Better When I'm Numb. Or a song that would at least be a, some kind of a match. And nothing nothing came up. But I was kind of afraid I'd never hear the song again. But months later, months later... It was all snowy and icy outside, and I was driving home again. And I hit my preset, and not only was that station just kind of crackling in a little bit, but they were playing the song again. So I didn't want to lose the, the signal, so when I got to my house, I started driving around in circles until the song was over. And then I ran up to my room and started writing down what I thought were the, some of the lyrics so that I had something to identify the song with. Because I really, I did not want to, I did not want to risk the chance of never hearing this song again. So a little while later, this is at this point it's 2002, I decided I want to go to, to Canada and ask around at some music stores, see if they know what the song is. So I called up my friend Rob and said, hey, I want to go to Canada and, and see if they can identify this song for me at a, at a music store. And he was on board with it. So Rob came, picked me up in this powder blue Buick Century. We drove about 20 minutes to the Detroit Windsor Tunnel. And when we get there, these uh, we must have had some kind of aura around us. We must have been setting off some kind of vibes because... They had two female border uh, crossing agents who got out of their booth and informed us that we needed to step out of the vehicle. So obviously we fit the profile or something of somebody that would be 
smuggling booze or pot or guns across the border. We didn't have any of that stuff with us. Um, but they start to go through the glove box of the car. They go under our seats. They go into the trunk. They're, they're looking for something that's not there. And they, they eventually had to admit defeat and uh, let us through. But I don't think they bought our our explanation that we were there to buy Canadian CDs. And that's probably the first time that anybody ever told them that that was the reason for their trip to Canada. But we, I guess we were suspicious. I guess our explanation was suspicious, but we got detained and they rummaged completely through that car. Coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, on the way back, we also had a border crossing agent stop us when he saw some uh, like modeling cement or glue in the back of Rob's car in the trunk. And he was grilling us about that. Um, reason was Rob uh, put it back there because his dad told him that he wanted him to carry it in case he got a flat tire, in case uh, you know, he needed something to patch the tire or plug the tire with. So he's like, okay, I'll just carry that in my trunk, and if I get a flat tire, I'll fix it with this glue. Unfortunately, the, the border agent did not buy that excuse at first, and he didn't really seem satisfied with the answer, but we were blocking traffic and, and holding up the line so long that I think he just decided it wasn't worth arguing with us about why we were carrying modeling cement in our trunk coming across the border he just he, he waved us through but I think that I think that was the last time that Rob ever went across the the border I think that kind of scared him from from ever wanting to go back uh, I mean it is fun over in Windsor it can be kind of it, it's it's cool to go over there and, and buy music and and bring it back but I think that scared him away I, I think after that he's like I I don't want to deal with this hassle I don't really blame him because it is a little it is annoying you want to go over there just to find some some cool CDs that you can't find in the US and you're getting people pulling you out of your car and and acting like they're gonna completely tear it apart it's I, I don't blame him for for not going back trust me but we did find a music store on Walker Road on, the, I think, the east side of Windsor. It was called, I think, the Disc Station. And speaking of dogs, their logo was this very poorly drawn dog. It was like computer animation. It was like just those straight line drawings where you basically you get a line and you make drawings out of like straight lines. And so this dog had it had like a it was a dog with a spiked collar and he had like like upside down triangles for legs and the tail was like a triangle and the whole it was just straight line computer drawings. There's just a straight line computer drawing of a dog and I never understood why they used that as the logo for a CD store. But it was a great store because it was helpful to us as Americans looking to buy rare or unavailable Canadian music because on those sleeves that they would have on the CD rack, it would tell you whether it was a Canadian artist. So it was like, you know, those sleeves, like there'll be a, a line of CDs there and then above it, there'll be like the white sleeve. It'll say ACDC and then there'll be more CDs behind it and there'll be a sleeve above it. Aerosmith and the, the CDs behind it there. So then you would find CDs, you would find that sleeve and for a Canadian artist it would be in parentheses Canadian artist. So for example, uh, Rob bought a Tea Party CD there, which is a Windsor based group appropriately. So it would say like the Tea Party and then in parentheses it'll say Canadian artist with like this, this drawing of a maple leaf. So it's very helpful to for us who are who were kind of collectors to know which ones were Canadian albums that might not be available to us on the other side of the border. But after describing the song a little bit, the two girls at the, at the store started looking at song titles and they said, well, here's a song called Numb from Holly McNerland. And they pulled the CD out. I looked at the lyrics. I'm like, that's it. That's the CD. And so I was so excited because we finally found it. And so 
I finally not only knew what the song was, but I got to buy it. Now, as far as the music goes, now that I got the border crossing story out of the way, uh, <laughs> um, lyrically, this is, I mean, I'm, I'm a heterosexual male. That's who I am. That's, take it or leave it, that's who I am. So songs about male sex servants, Elmo, or about male porn stars, porno mouth, are definitely not in my, uh, are definitely, uh, they're not in my demographic. They, this was definitely written for a, a female demographic. Uh, as you can see in the, the inside jewel case here, it's pink. She's got a cute little dog on the front. It's it's got pink on it. This is definitely kind of for woman. It is intended for a female audience. So maybe surprising that I like the CD so much. But I mean, then there's a song called Mystery Song, which she doesn't even have any lyrics. She just chants ah. So. I don't really relate to most of this. This is mostly like the the young female demographic. But this is but I love the music. Um, the, I like the snare sound. I like a lot of the guitar uh, the guitar work. Uh, and I, I like her voice on this material. I think her voice is going to be kind of a. Uh, an acquired taste for a lot of people, but I think it works with these songs. She's written and created songs that complement her voice, that her voice is at home on. I, I do hear some singers where they they just like over sing or they sing certain things that don't really fit with the song and it gets annoying. I'm, I'm not really annoyed with her voice um, on, on any of these. I think some of her material could get a uh, I think some of the songs she could sing if she chose to would get annoying, but she didn't uh, with that voice. But I think her voice actually works with these songs. Uh, again, I love the music, the, the, the drumming, the, the, the guitar parts. I listened to this one recently. Um, got through almost the entire CD without fast forwarding through anything. It kept me interested. So it's proof that you don't necessarily need to be of the target demographic to truly enjoy the music. And you can enjoy something musically without completely relating to what they're saying about numb is pretty much about a life of a heroin addict. That's why it's still kind of dark and tortured sounding. I've never been on heroin. But I can understand, what, uh, I can almost feel what it's like to go through that world of addiction because the song is so well made. It, it, and so as I said, she was like 22 years old when she released this album uh, or when she recorded it. She was 21 or 22. And so for, for her age, this is a strong album. This is really well made for, for somebody in their early 20s. Um, she didn't look 22 or 21. That's her there. She doesn't really look, she looks older than that. But as far as whether this could have had more potential, I believe yes. Um, actually, Coward, there's a song here called Coward that I did hear on The Rock. And I kind of thought it was the same artist. I'm like, that sounds like the girl that did that Numb song. And then when I bought the CD, I saw there's a song called Coward on here. I'm like, oh, so that was the same artist. So Coward was a radio hit. Numb was a big hit. They had a video for Numb. I just don't think enough effort was put into the uh, marketing this in the U.S. I think Numb and Coward both could have been much larger hits for her if the record label really tried to push this uh, a little harder into stateside into stateside release, and uh, if, if U.S. stations had gotten hold of it, it was partially recorded in the U.S. A lot of these Canadian albums are recorded in the U.S., maybe even mixed in the U.S., but then they just go to Canada, release it strictly in Canada, and we never see it. And I think that's the case with this. I don't believe this was ever sold in the U.S., and 
I mean, I, none of the radio stations that I know have played it. And I think it had a lot of potential. I really do think that the potential is there. It was recorded partially in the U.S. It was mixed in Miami, I think it said. But we never really, we never heard it over here. And I think she could have gotten a lot further in her career. And I think this album could have sold a lot more copies. I think those songs are, I think some of the tracks on here are, are strong enough where they definitely could have found a larger audience had the label pushed this a little harder. So is, there, is most of the material relatable to me? Nah, not if I were to really carefully read the lyric sheets and like, no, I can't relate to any of this stuff. Is the music really good? Is it good musically? Yeah. And as I said, I listened to this whole thing almost all the way through recently without skipping over any songs. And that's a feat because a lot of these 90s albums, they have a great song. I'll hear a, a song that I absolutely love off the album. Then I'll go buy the album, and that's the only good song on the album. This is this to me was listenable almost the entire way through. That is a pretty impressive uh, feat for a, a '90s alternative rock album, especially one that's uh, recorded by somebody who is only like 22 years old. So on that note. Well, was this worth getting detained at the border? <laughs> Probably not. I, I mean, a little embarrassing. Having people think we're gun smugglers or pot smugglers or something. But it was definitely, but all, all in all, was it worth the effort to find this song, to find this album? Was it worth the wait to find out who it was? Was it worth the effort to locate the CD? Yes. And on that note, it's a four out of five for stuff, Holly McNarland. And I need to find a new I need to find a new jewel case for this one. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.